And he's going, die, you English pigs. <laughs> And I heard the song, Lee Owie, Lee Owie, Lee Owie, your brother is a... And I turned round and it was me mum. <laughs> what on earth are Newcastle players looking pretty much before they go down? And it's a full-on porn movie. Pollock wasn't very happy and he'd stood up and he'd get into Peter's face and Peter just stepped back, man. Fuck me, you're ugly. Such a wonderful player, but the filthiest, dirtiest man you could ever meet. <laughs> Tino! Tino! When the fucking ball yo comes up, yo, no more fucking flicking yo. <laughs> I used to mention that to Kevin and just sort of see, we're getting killed here. And he'd be like, well, it's entertaining. <laughs> Your fans love it. Them. Listen, you fucking baldy bastard. He went, you call me one more time. Me and you's going outside. And I was going, fucking sit down, you idiot. I know Keith tells it and tells it in his book, but he, he, he withholds information. <laughs> um, so I'm going to divulge it. <laughs> Gentlemen, how are we doing? Morning, Chris. Morning. Good morning. morning. Fresh right? as the days of this morning. Yeah, yeah, you've had your bacon sandwich. I can see a little bit of ketchup. Runny egg. Well, you failed to order me an egg, didn't you? <laughs> Dickhead. <laughs> Matty stole it. If you ordered yourself an egg. <laughs> I ordered two eggs between four of us. <laughs> why? I don't know. <laughs> why, why? As if everybody don't want a bacon sandwich. No, there was yeah. bacon in them. With an egg on. Mm. We good? Sorry, lads. Yeah, All good. Really good. Yeah. New market today. Big meeting on today as well. Mm. Me and Johnny are going in the paddocks afterwards. Oh, yes. <laughs> Steve, shan't how are we this week? Shan't be riding, mind, because I've not been the weight. <laughs> I uh, don't think the horse could say the weight, to be honest. <laughs> Funny enough, right, you said that. We uh, we booked Mrs. Dad her horse riding. You know, like, one of these red letter days. Yeah. So I thought, oh, fuck it, I fancy a bash on that and all. Anyway, we bought the, the tickets and that. So we phoned up the gaff and uh, they said, ah, what, what weight are the people who are going to be on it? Uh, and it would seem that we've both got to chop a leg off if we want to do this excursion. <laughs> Five stone of a weight we are. For the safety of the horses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going, we, honestly, you had, to be, you had to be 15 stone, no more. Uh, so we've had to cancel and we, we're now going camel trekking because we think we've half a chance of, of getting on. I went on an horse, horse trekking job once, and you know, when they are, have you been horse riding before? No. And I'm, no, they asked me. Oh. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do you know when you, you're just a bit brash, you're like, yeah, how bad can it be like sitting on an horse? I was like, yeah, yeah never sat on an horse. Like, oh my God, they were galloping through fields. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, on it's all about your core. You need a strong it core, yeah. Oh, it'd so be nice for so when I got off, I'll tell you that would have been fine. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, so we've, unfortunately we've had to cancel the red letter day due oh to dear. weight restrictions. So what, what's the um, alternative? Uh, we're going out on piss. <laughs> That's a good alternative. <laughs> Results. Yeah. Having a weekend away instead. <laughs> Steve, how are we this week? It's good a good episode, one. yeah. Very good. Solid, like, but that era, again, you know, like, we've had some good Keegan. episodes from that era. The Kira, Kira era, the, the entertainers. And they've all been entertaining. Mm. Who's got, who, they've lived up to the name. I think it's due an, a, another email to Faustino, me. Is it that time? Yeah, another Spanish email. To I'll Faustino. try it. If, if at first you don't succeed, just Tino, how are you, son? <laughs> just, ba just badger him. Just badger him until he goes, oh, for fuck, fuck it, I'm going on. <laughs> who, who even is this? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot he was at Man City. Stevie. Yeah. Yeah. So he goes to Man City, Leicester. Yeah. Yeah. What about Dave O's man? Oh, you know what I mean? Brilliant. <laughs> See, do you know during it? I, 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 didn't, I didn't pick up on I it. I didn't pick up on as, as many as you know what I mean. Yeah. But See, I did because I think his mate messaged before, left a comment saying, how many times is he going to say, do you know what I mean? And I couldn't not think about it then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I didn't know. Every now and again, he chucked, he chucked in, a, you know what I'm saying, which was a nice... Just to mix it up. Nice it's a change. It. Yeah. To be fair, he's got on board with it, hasn't he? <laughs> I know there what you're you saying. You know he's what I mean? What? He's got on board with it. Yeah, he's not, he's, yeah. Not yeah. It, he's not took it as criticism, has he? No, oh, is it but, but oh, great, but great episode. I think he's right. laugh. right bash for us on Twitter and all, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's, his laugh cracked me up, man. Yeah, no, it's up there with, with one of my favourites. Got that, haven't we? Yes. Oh yeah, but a quick mention to the sponsor for this this week's episode, uh, Foot Mob. You, this is a bit of you, Johnny. Go on. Live scores. Oh, we all, uh, well, that's what I, that's my coupon on a Saturday yeah. over 2.5s. Not just live scores, though. There's, there's news on the stats. I mean, if, if, whether you're a casual fan or a, like a proper stat or like you, John, 
Right. Well, I'm obviously not a proper stat arm, but I, I do like to check who's who's looking likely to concede and score goals. But you can you, you tailor those um, live updates to your needs. Yeah, so you can pick pick your certain teams and get team news and so not yeah. just teams either, like pl- individual individuals. players. So, so fantasy you, football. Yeah. Are you a fantasy football man? No. No, too much organisation. But even if there's a player that you just like. Yeah. Do you know just like I mean? the look of him. Yeah. Yeah, was, who's, you know, who's your favourite? Do, oh, I'd have had um, I'd have had a Anna Gunwags and Sasha Searchit on there. You know, just keeping <laughs> just keeping an eye on. The, you know, like he's having a coffee a, today, Anna. Yeah. <laughs> Good lad. He's, have, he's having another Smirnoff Ice. <laughs> <laughs> that you him. know, like there's a player at your, at your club who like moves on, but you you, you want to keep an eye on You've the got career. An, an affinity. Well. One of your favourites. Yeah. yeah, you can just pick that player and he. <laughs> he'll give you an update when he's starting, when he's got an assist, when he's got a goal. Injury news and I tell you what. The bookies could be in bother with my two point over two point fives now. Now I've got this lad. It's like an odds comparison as well. It gives you the best odds for certain things and Yeah. You can pick Download your league. it after Johnny. If you want to follow League One, you can just click League One and it gives you all the updates for League One. Or like we said, if you want to keep an eye on Patrick Bamford, how he's doing. Not much at the minute. You won't get any updates at the minute, <laughs> would you? His foot is still sore. Mm. But uh, no, it's uh, and the news section as well. It's, yeah, it's really it's the good. Best, up best to date app that I've used. F O T M O B. That right? Yep. And we've got a link in the description on the audio and the video, so you can clip through and download that app. Excellent news. Good luck bashing the bookies. We've mm. got the other two point fives. What else have we got to talk about? We've Man City last night. Yeah, oh, brilliant one. That. Do you know what? The last 10 minutes. You know, you know, like people are going, it's a disgrace and all that. I like it. Yeah, I did. Like, it's brilliant. Greel- did, you, did you like Grealish's? Oh, mm. he's got it, 120 millis worth now. Yeah. Me. It's money well, well spent that, money just for that. Yeah. The delivery. <laughs> yeah, the delivery. You know you, you're a cunt. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no aggressive. Yeah. Just, do you know you? Just informing him. Yeah, do you know you, you're a cunt. <laughs> I, I perfectly, played it perfect, I think. And then obviously he's grabbed his hair and me, he's, he's, me, not, he's not me, retaliated. Me, me. You? Uh, I, I Did you see them in the tunnel? Yeah. Did, what, Scotty Carson? Oh, no. He wasn't even, well, obviously he wasn't playing, but he wasn't even part of the melee. And then he just appears over somebody's shoulder and just going, offering to meet them at the top of the stairs for a scrap. <laughs> yeah. He's like, that, <laughs> that is old school. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just hands in his pocket and he's went, Outside, upstairs, <laughs> you and me upstairs. <laughs> but the police, you see the police got involved. Yeah. Oof. They come in waving the costume, yeah. all them lads over there, don't they? They went speak. straight for the City lads, they just left the Madrid lads. Speak from experience, Bastards. they come in with the costumes, yeah. them lads. Mm-hmm. Mm. Bish bash bosh. Funny man. But uh, but yeah, I, I don't, like they say, people were like on Twitter, I don't want to, we don't want to see that and all that. Fucking brilliant, it's isn't it? It's exactly what we want to see. Yeah. Man. Mm. You know what I mean? A big 25 man. Yeah. I'll tell you, Jin, Jinchenko, is it Jinchenko? Yeah. He, he, he got involved. About, he? Get off my man. Get off Phil. Leave him up the air. Phil, Phil. Phil's not, Phil's not windmilling, is he? It, well, nah, he might be windmilling, but he, you, you want someone like Jinchenko behind him, don't you? Phil's bandaged up. Looks like uh, Terry Butcher, but not with the white blood stained thing. It was just. Uh, I, I, I've got a lot of time for it. I mate. have. Sim, what do you think of Simeone? I, I, I you don't know where he is, do you? Think, <laughs> do you think he'll get a job? Do you think he'll... I don't think he'll do it. I will. But it, I, bet, I bet you he could, he could dish out a bollocking like. Oh, tell you what he done though, right? Obviously, he's, I think his highest paid coach in the world, but he's actually killing that team because they're actually better than... When they played at City away, they played a 5-5 none. Yeah. They're better than that. I only saw the second half, but apparently it was chalk and cheese. They sat, they sat back first half, and then second half they did what bash. they could have done and looked good. Yeah. F- f- five, five, none. That's piss poor, isn't it? Mm. Have you seen the lad at Palace who's uh, put out instructions for his celebration? Yeah, I don't like that. What's yeah. it called? Philip? Mateta. Mateta, <clears throat> yeah. He's Because he, he kicks the corner flag, doesn't he, when he scores? And he's put a note out to the fans that when he kicks the corner flags, he wants them to say, boom. Right. What's your yeah, thoughts? I think that's very wankerish, me. Yeah. Mm. It's, these things should have a natural progression, shouldn't they? Mm. You can't be scripted. To be honest, should he just be glad that he's playing? 
He's doing well though, isn't he? He, he is, but he's, uh, I think that we get somebody better than him. But mm. so boom. Yeah, I think, I think it's. Uh, it's a bit like when your when your mate comes over to you at school and says, "Well, can you start calling me Knuckles now." He like <laughs> gives himself a nickname. <laughs> That is hundred percent you at school. That yeah, <laughs> nooks. No, I, I've not got. I've not got a lot, lot of time for that. To be honest, not got a lot of time for it. But should we get Stevie in then? Yeah, let's get him in. Let him in the door. Two minutes, Stevie. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever uh, go on trial at Sunderland or out? Was there a chance to play for them? Um, well, I was obviously a, a schoolboy playing um, primary school football. There was no Premier League then, obviously, but you just had uh, all the scouts from all the f- like first division, uh, which it was called then. Um, and I didn't, I never ever wanted to leave home. I went to Man United as a kid. I went to Leicester as a kid, uh, but it was always going to be between Sunderland and Newcastle. Um, when around that time at, at Sunderland, sorry, there was a bloke called George Hurt, who was a fantastic player, played for Scotland, played for Sunderland, unbelievable player. He was. Uh, he was one of the, the scouts along with a, a, a bloke called Harry Dent who was, used to wear like a Trilby hat. Um, but yeah, I was always just down to down to them two clubs. At that particular time, though, Sunderland's manager was Lauren McMenemy. Uh, and I met him at a training session that I was doing, obviously, in the six weeks holidays. Remember when, I mean, I'm obviously a little bit older, but in the six weeks holidays, I used to go into the club and do the six weeks at a, at a club and train as, as like schoolboys. Um, and I met Laurie McMenemy and he was quite rude actually um, and to the point where when I'd gone back and I'd, I told my dad what he'd sort of said my dad um, wanted an apology and because he'd, he'd sort of he'd spoke to me Laurie McMenemy and asked me you know basically it should be a privilege to sign for Sunderland which I think Sunderland's a fantastic club and, and I think people are lucky to, to play for Sunderland or anybody's lucky to play for some very good clubs uh, but he kind of slagged me off on the on the on the radio and on the TV. And my dad sort of thought he was out of order. Bear in mind, I was twelve, and all of <laughs> this on radio. <laughs> and uh, because oh, I was man. just like, listen, I want to kind of um, look at all the different clubs uh, before I make my mind up. I, I, I was at, a, at primary school. I was I was always a midfield player, and I scored a shed load of goals, and pretty much out of the all of the championship, of the scouts. Everyone wanted me to go to their club, but as I said, it was just it, I was I was a mammy's boy to be quite honest. So I did I, I never want to leave home. So it was always just going to be between Sunderland and Newcastle. I can't believe that he's fucking house is on the radio at twelve. 12. You know yeah. what I mean? That, that is ruthless, that isn't it? Mm. He called me an arrogant little kid, and really? there was no arrogance really because he just sort of said you be uh, you, you must be honoured to be signing for Sunderland. I went well, I'm not. I said, I want to have a look at, 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 like, kind of, I want to go to different clubs and different training sessions and stuff like that, um, which seems quite switched on, I suppose, for a 12 year old. But I just wanted to see what was out there. You know, even then, that was my whole dream was to be a professional footballer. <clears throat> and I wanted to make sure that I made the right choice because it's a bit different now. I mean, you know yourself, it used to be like a two year apprenticeship. Mm. And then if you were lucky, you got a pro. Like a one-year pro, mm. if that. You know, not many signed a two-year pro, so I just wanted to see what was the best one for me. But at that time, it was always just going to be between the two clubs. Were you, at sort of 12, 14, were you really good compared to everybody else? Yeah. I mean, without trying to be a bit of a tit, um, yeah, I was. I was really good. I mean, I, I, I said from, from a midfield position, I would score um, in one season, it was like 106 goals. Um, but there was always there was always this kind of um, rivalry between me and Lee Clark, even though Lee Clark was a year younger. Uh, played for Sullen Boys, he played for Newcastle Boys. Um, we used to I remember one game one three two. I scored three, he scored two. Uh, but it was always just sort of like people were desperate to sign me or me or him. Nash was always going to sign for Newcastle, Lee Clark. Uh, but I was unsure. But obviously, my little taste that I had at Man United didn't like. Um, and the taste that I had at Leicester, I, I met a lad called Paul Kitson, who I eventually ended up playing with at Newcastle. Um, it was just down to the two clubs, and ultimately I chose Newcastle, which proved to be the best decision. And um, I made my debut with 17 Man United away. Um, Newcastle were already relegated, so it was the last game of the season. 
and it was just a nice taste to sort of play at Old Trafford and against these players. Like, remember the Shoot magazine? Yeah. And you used to put pictures up on your wall and stuff like that. I'm actually standing next to them playing against them, which was, like, bizarre. Um, the following year, I didn't get a sniff. And then I came in uh, really under Aussie. And Aussie Ardeles was brilliant. But I think what Aussie had done is he'd kind of got rid of um, Roy Aitken, um, Mark McGee. Cunny was there, but he was on the, a kind of periphery a little bit because he just wanted the kids in. It was me, Lee Clark, Steve Watson, Rob Elliott, Alan Thompson. And at times, though, it was like men against boys and it proved that. And, of course, I'm up front. I'm from Sunderland. I'm playing, I've got the number nine on. So I'm basically a Mac. I'm playing for Newcastle at number nine. Not great. Uh, <laughs> so the, the actual start of my Newcastle career as a first-team player didn't go very well. But a few messages changed. about the people. A lot of people have said it's the favourite ever Sunderland song. Can you sing it? The Sunderland never saw it. Well, from the Sunderland point of view, I actually find it quite funny. Um, it didn't take a lot of thinking. <laughs> 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 it, was, it literally took them about 30 seconds to, <laughs> to think of it. And you'll have to excuse me for the language because it's not my language. Uh, but my brother played for Sunderland. And um, and the Sunderland song for me is Liawi, 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 your brother is a cunt. <laughs> Simple but effective, so, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it, it gets to the point. It needs to say. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's quite bizarre, really, because, <laughs> I mean, I've been retired now, bloody hell, nearly 20 years and I still get it <laughs> but the most bizarre thing was one of my jobs for the Premier League is the, the things called Premier Skills so we go all over the world and we coach other coaches or we bring up other coaches so they can go out in, in different places and coach kids and we covered Africa, Asia, South America and America and um, I was actually heading to Nigeria and every single time we went to one of these countries, you had to go to either the embassy or the British Council to check in, make sure everything's all right. And um, we were in Lagos, and we had to we had to drive to the um, to the embassy. But we pulled up beside the em embassy in a uh, in a minibus, and the walls were getting redone. And um, we had the windows open because there was no, uh, no aircon. And I'm in Lagos in Nigeria, and we're parked up just before we got into the embassy. And I hear, Leo, we, Leo, we, Leo, we. <laughs> the lad, <laughs> the lad who was fixing the wall was from Sunderland <laughs> and recognised me. And I don't mind, to be quite honest. And I, I thought it was quite funny. But I do draw the line because I was walking in Durham a couple of weeks ago and I was with my wife and I heard the song, Leo, we, Leo, we, Leo, we, your brother is a... And I turned round and it was me mum. <laughs> so it was a... I thought you've kind of overstepped. <laughs> <laughs> she writes it in your birthday card. <laughs> Madness. It's a beauty. <laughs> Going back to Ardiles, what was he like? He never really gets a mention, does no. he? No. We've had a few that have played under him, but he's training. Did, and... did he push you, push you back? Into, Do you know what? It was, it was his original idea to, to, to play at centre-half because when we had like um, five sides at the end of a training session, uh, I used to just go to the back. Because I have to be honest, I've, I've found it reasonably easy. It's a lot easier than scoring goals. That is that is a fact. That's where I went wrong, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you should have been centre half. You'd have played for fucking England. <laughs> so he, he just kind of said to me, "Have you ever thought about playing at the back?" And basically, it was a just a flat no. No, I haven't. Um, so we had a couple of games behind clo like behind closed doors. And do you know when you've got like a a player that's never played at the back and he's just giving away fouls and stuff like that? He just missed time and stuff. Anyway, it didn't come to fruition purely and simply because Ozzy had been uh, Ozzy got sacked, and then obviously Kevin came in, and how it all came about was the fact that again we had a couple of games behind closed doors. I played one up front, I played one in midfield, and one at the back, and then Kevin pulled me and just sort of said, you know, I've got big ideas for this club. I think I'm, you know, it's got the potential to go really far. I'm not going to take you on if you want to be a midfield player or a, or a forward, but I think you've got potential as a defender. It's up to you. Have a chat with your family um, and, and come back to us. Now, no need. That's a, all right, we'll give it a go and we'll see where we go. And ultimately, within about four or five years, I was playing for England. Brilliant, and that's mad, that, isn't it? That mm. They've both seen that Seems somewhat so different to what you thought you were going to be. Well, yeah, I mean, as I said, it's, it's quite bizarre, really. And, and we went on from being this really awful team 
to this club that was just the snowball effect with Kevin coming in and then the players that he was bringing in. Uh, we just went from just about surviving to going into League 2, I think it was, or League 3, whatever it was then, uh, to actually staying up. The next year we won the league and then the following year, I think, you know, we finished in the in the top five, top six of the Premier League. Or it wasn't, was it the Premier League then? It was... It was just a ridiculous turnaround. And then obviously the influx of players that we brought in was just scary. Do you put that down to Kevin? Yes, absolutely. Because, I mean, he was such a big name. Um, and I think players, when we were on TV, um, looked at the, our style of play and, and just thought, yeah, I want a piece of that. Uh, because we were just so forward thinking, so wanting to sort of attack. I mean, I know the defence got some stick. Because we were wide open. You know, if I played with Philippe Albert, Philippe used to just piss off. Sometimes <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd look and Philippe would be stood next to Les Ferdinand or Shearer. Whereas if I had Darren Peacock, I knew Peasy would be there. Bez, left hand side, gone. Warren Barton or Steve Watson, gone. You know, so when we lost the ball, it was like. <laughs> he was left holding the baby. Get back, lads! Yeah. Get yeah. fucking back! Well, that was the funny thing because Peasy used to do the trumpet. Because when we lose the ball, Pease used to go, did it, did it, did it. <laughs> and we used to have about five or six players running down us. The rest of the boys had bugger off. <laughs> was there a case after games when you're like, lads, fuck me, we're going to have to tighten up a little bit, man? Well, yeah, of course. And I, I used to mention that to Kevin and just sort of see, we're fucking getting killed here. And he'd be like, but it's entertaining. <laughs> the fans love it. The, the fans have paid the money to be entertained. We're entertaining them. And I'm like, fucking hell, entertain us. Like, it's just like, what the are you not entertained? But we're getting <laughs> murdered in there, I mean, crazy. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, everybody's getting like great marks or oh, a fantastic team defensively. <laughs> shit, how <laughs> shit, Peacock, shit. Plus the rest of them are pissed off. Howie three, <laughs> Peacock four, must do better. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the year that we lost the, the Premier League title to Man United and everybody went, oh, it's defensively and stuff like that, we actually conceded less goals to Man United that season. Uh, but, yeah, we did concede goals, but we were just so forward-thinking in the way that we wanted to play. That was just, that was the sacrifice. Kevin's team talks was, if they score three, it's not a problem, we'll score four. Because look at the players that we've got. Look around the dressing room. You know, you've got Ginola, you've got Beardsley, it could be Cole or Shearer or Ferdinand, Keith Gillespie. You just The list goes on. Rob Elliott was... Uh, Rob Lee, sorry, we used to arrive in the box and score goals, and it was pretty scary. The training sessions were absolutely frightening, but... I mean, it was a fantastic time to play at that particular time. So no shift in his philosophy? Like, Kevin's? Yeah, do you think he, there should have been? That um, no, not really. I think the, the, where it went wrong was when, um, when we were closing in on the title, Kevin changed the, the, the structure of the team. Um, Tino used to get some stick because it was always oh, because when, he, when he, he brought in Tino Asprey, it wasn't Tino's fault. Because our team at the particular time is we had Keith Gillespie on the right hand side, we had Pedro, Peter Beasley behind Les, and we, so we were fine. We had obviously David, and um, that that was it. We were sorted. Obviously, we had Lee Clark in midfield as well, but then we brought in Bats, David Batty, and he and he integrated Tino. So therefore, all of a sudden now you've got David Batty where Lee Clark was at the back end of the season after Liverpool, the first four three game that we got beat off Liverpool. I, I done my hamstring when it was 3-3. So I was out. Lee Clark was out. Keith Gillespie was out because obviously Tino had to play with Les and you've got to get Pedro in somewhere. And um, he went on the right-hand side and Keith Gillespie was out. So the, the balance of the team completely shifted. Were you on the bus when uh, T Tino brought his own video on? <laughs> we used to... I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a bit different now because obviously you look at teams, they've got all the, the fancy buses... But otherwise, they might fly or they'll get the train and stuff like that. We had a Moordale bus, and it was nice at the time. You know, tables in, a couple of, like, we had three or four tellies in there. But we used to have Steve Watson, who, he, he was the, what we classed as the entertainment manager. Because Watto used to sit at home and watch MTV and press play and record on the, for, a, like, a VHS video. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> and he used, to bring the he used to bring that on the bus, and obviously the lads used to listen to music. Um, John Beresford used to do quizzes and stuff like that. Obviously, we had a couple of card tables. Lads, some of the lads used to play for big money at the back. But it was me, Rob Lee, Bez and Scott Sellers. We used to play just for pennies. Um, but we used to have a, we used to train at Durham, a place called Maiden Castle. 
we used to have thousands come and watch us train. I mean, it was ridiculous. And um, I used to, we used to have to finish training early because we because we, we all knew, and Kevin knew, that it, would took us, it, it takes us about an hour to get in the changing room just to do, like, the signings and pitches and stuff like that, get changed. You've got the same coming back to get on the bus. So we, the bus is always parked uh, on, on the grounds of, of Castle Eden, and it's surrounded, again, hundreds and hundreds of people surround the bus. And um, Tino just thought it was a good idea for the lads for entertainment to stick one of his videos on. Because the week before, he'd put some music on and it was this Latino Colombian stuff and Shearer went down the bus when we were driving down the A19, ejected it and turned around and went, Aspria, shit. He'd opened up the latch and <laughs> winged it down the A19. <laughs> so Tino just thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll spice it up a little bit. So he brought this video and he, Ken, the driver, he, uh, Put this on. So he puts it on. We're all set. We're waiting for Terry Mack and the gaffer. And um, can you remember the videos when they used to put them in? It used to go... <laughs> and then the picture would come up. Anyway, we'd like batter and tea and all. What the hell's this? Get this shit off. It hasn't even started. And he go, no, no, you must watch. You must watch. He was from Hartlepool, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just kind of... <clears throat> the camera is like focused on these high heels the high heel shoes and the camera kind of pa like pans out and then you see these long leg stockings and it's all this like silk underwear and silk uh, like kind of a dressing gown I'd, it must be a posh name for it but it's this silk stuff negligee this woman like, <laughs> what is it negligee negligee there you go. <laughs> I don't know how the fuck you know that one like, there you go. and um, we're like looking at each other and thinking no surely not I mean we've identified straight away we're thinking surely not and of course, there's this dodgy music getting playing. She's in this magnificent, like, kind of villa, marble floors and all this kind of thing. And she's looking out and absolutely stunning woman. And then you just hear a knock on the door. And she walks across marble floors, walks across high heel shoes on, stockings, all the gear, opens the door. <clears throat> and there's a geezer standing there. And he's got his good bushy beard, white t shirt on, jeans with a big buckle belt with all these tools and stuff. <laughs> what are you What's your machine, bro? Classic. <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> and literally, before you know it, these two are getting right into it, and she is screaming the place <laughs> down. The bloke is absolutely battering her. <laughs> but we've also got a picture, the fact that we've got hundreds and hundreds of people around the bus, <laughs> and they can see the TVs. So this woman is screaming the place down because this bloke is going for a hell for leather. And you can see the, the, the husbands, the boyfriends, the wives, the girlfriends, the kids. The husbands are trying to move the wives and kids out the way <laughs> while trying to look, thinking, <coughs> what on earth are Newcastle players looking pretty much before they go down? And it's a full-on porn movie. So Kevin and Terry Mack comes up, and all he can hear is this woman screaming. <laughs> and he's going, what's this? Get this off. It's on like four tellies. <laughs> And everybody's like thinking, bloody hell, what they're watching. This woman's screaming. Anyway, Kevin's just about to reject it. Tino comes running down the bus. No, 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 you must keep this on. This is my new missus. <laughs> it was his new girlfriend. <laughs> and that was his way of introducing the lads to his new girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, a, my word. That's, that's incredible. <laughs> Even if, you, even if she were a porn star, I don't think you'd want the lads to watch it, would you? Huh. But she was obviously got on his head from the week before. Yeah. I'll show you, uh, Al. Yeah. yeah, fuck you, Al. <laughs> Could he speak much English, Tino? So you know? Well, again, I mean, you know yourself, lads, that you know when you get a foreign lad in and they don't speak a great deal of English, you'll just learn them swear words and stuff like that. Tino was cleverer than what he let on. He knew bits of English, and when he needed to, he'd actually you know, come out with a sentence that was needed. But um, a lot of the times it was just swear words. I mean, I think <laughs> even even now, I think you've got uh, Bruno Guimaraes, that's uh, Newcastle, and he's putting things on Twitter and he's ending it with uh, the word bastard. Uh, and he was just sort of even sort of saying to um, the, the Newcastle ladies team, uh, good luck, but I think he put good luck bastard or something <laughs> like that. And just thinking, Who's uh, but all the lads, whoever's <laughs> told him, John George Shelby's like that. <laughs> I've got him. Yeah. I've got him. <laughs> 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 so,
So have you still got that video, Steve, uh, <laughs> from Fastina? I, I have, but I haven't got uh, VHS, unfortunately. <laughs> 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 how were the when you were first coming through? How were the that older generation? Were you, you know, the 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 Kilclines and he was meant to be the main man, wasn't he? Yeah, I think um, one of one of the best, most underrated signings I think Kevin ever made was Killer. Um, he just brought a calmness to the place, a more structured um, sort of dynamic to the dressing rooms and stuff like that. Lads absolutely loved him. Wore horrendous, horrendous gear. For some reason, he just loved these cord, uh, cord trousers that he used to wear. I think they were like kind of a rustic colour. <laughs> uh, I mean, the boys used to batter him, but he was absolutely brilliant for the dressing room. Um, Organised, whereas, you know, yourself, when, when clubs will be wanting, oh, can we have such and such to come and open this or make an appearance? It always used to be the same people, whereas we, we sort of set it out where everybody had to take the turn. So, you know, all the money that goes in the kitty for the end of the season. For the lads, I mean, as I said, it's different now for players. There's none of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we could use that money to, to go away to wherever we want to go. But it was a lot more structured. But he just he was just brilliant on and off the pitch. An absolute ideal signing in that particular time. You weren't there when somebody cut his hair? Do you know what? We just did won the league and we went to Ayanapa. And um, my first wife, uh, she wasn't very happy with us, with, with us going to Ayanapa. And um, so I didn't go, and all the boys was like pestering us for like. Obviously, they were at the airport, you know, like, where you're at, where you're at. And I just knew it was just going to be more grief than what it was. So I just didn't bother. I was still only young at the time as well. I was stupid. I just told me, Mrs. to piss off and went. <laughs> <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, but I know, like Barry Venison used to always sort of see how I'd love to cut his hair, I'd love to cut his hair. But it was it was well known, leave his hair alone, you know, because he loves his hair. Uh, he loved his tash. And, um, but obviously, Killer had had a hard year. He looked after the lads and everything. And, of course, the boys have got there. Killer's had a couple of, uh, couple of scoops and passed out. And then when he woke up, um, this side of his tash had gone <laughs> and this side of his hair. <laughs> also, they went alternate. <laughs> yeah. And oh, they put, put it in a glass. So when he eventually <clears throat> come to, he just seen his hair and absolutely lost the plot. Um, and I think uh, Liam O'Brien had mentioned something about, I think Derek Vazakli might have been involved, Venice might have been involved, and one or two others. Um, I think he knocked on Faz's door and punched him straight in the face. Faz's coach at this point? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and then obviously, the, I mean, there was hell broke loose. And that the brought... The thing is, if, he's, if he just doesn't know why, he knows why, doesn't he? Why, you know, just getting a punch... You think he? Why has he just hit me? And then you look well, at him. Faz knew. He's going to have a tash. <laughs> and 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 oh, that's that. why. Faz knew what the situation was because the lads had just obviously finished the drinks and left <coughs> left killer there because um, he passed out and the boys had gone to bed. Um, but I was so pleased I wasn't there because um, killer wasn't the same when we came back, yeah. um, and the atmosphere was different because he'd felt as though. After he'd done all that for the lads, they'd kind of shit on him a little bit. And to be fair, they did. So I, get that, like, I was I was pleased I wasn't there. That's uh, that, that, there's banter and there's banter, isn't there? You know what I mean? Because he had a long long head, didn't he? I remember right. It's going to take him a good year, eighteen months to grow that. Well, back. that was a part of his identity. Yeah, you know his hair and stuff, and he used to have his ponytail and and bits and pieces. But you know, there's all it's, there's one thing do like talking about and having a laugh, and then there's another thing completely yeah, yeah. doing it. I suppose nobody owning up as well. That makes it worse because then it's like he's obviously being protected by the rest of the team, like you feel. But I imagine he's a bit more ostracised. Yeah, all the lads laughing. I think it's probably just him. as well because he'd probably be in a Cypriot prison. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as I said, the, the, the dynamics of the team changed a little bit after that. Venice, had, Venice um, admitted afterwards. Um, I know Killers Miss has got involved. Uh, Lynn, I think her name was. And they were hurt, and I, I understand why they were hurt because, you know, we, we could have had maybe stronger characters that should have just went, nah, that doesn't happen. Yeah, mm. but there's lines, in, there's levels in there. Yeah, did um, did Keegan give much much trust in Terry McDermott? You know, was he assistant? <clears throat> yeah, Terry Mac was assistant. I mean, people forget, you know, when Terry was there, what a player he was. By the way, I mean, everybody thinks well, Kevin Keegan, you know, the England and obviously uh, Hamburg and. European player, the Terry done all that, 
and he was an unbelievable player, Terry. The goals that, if, if you look back at like the different clips of Terry at Liverpool and stuff like that, my God, what, a, what an awesome player he was. Um, but one of his other jobs was at the start of a new season, um, he used to go around the lads, have you changed your mobile number, have you moved house and all that kind of thing. But if you ever speak to Terry, he's got a bit of a lisp. He's like short long. <laughs> and uh, when he was going around for the addresses and stuff like that, the boys, I just had moved and I was still living in Sunnet. And um, my address, and you can check this because it's absolutely true, my address was 66 Ski View, Sultzworth, Sunderland, <laughs> SR3, 4PW. <laughs> so <laughs> my nickname is Boy. So the lads was like, Boy, when Terry Mack comes to you, we've got to be there. And he was like, Right, Clive, how are you? What are you doing? <laughs> and I went, he was going, six, six, Steve, you, six, 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 But he was just, he actually thought I was making it up. But it was actually the right address, it was the proper address. <laughs> As if he's gone into it halfway through, he's gone halfway through it and then gone, he's taking a bit. Brilliant bloke. I know he's been a little bit, I actually seen him on Saturday, Saturday, yeah, I seen him on Saturday. I was at the Liverpool game and um, he looks a lot better because I know he was a bit pooly. Um, but what a, what a great bloke he was. Mm. Absolute legend. See that, like, as if Kevin Keegan's got a, a bloke in just to really entertain the lads and mm. keep things just ticking over nicely. It's, it's mad, really. That's so, his job. Yeah. Was there no shape in training then? Was it just... No, a... no we brought in um, Chris McMenemy. We brought in Mark Lawrenson as uh, defensive coach. That was an absolute the worst pile of shite we've ever known because <laughs> it just didn't work because Lauro, to be fair, Lauro, we were trying to put on sensible ses uh, sessions and Kevin used to look across and see the boys like kind of, this is boring. And it wasn't a, wasn't a font of Lauro at all. There were, there were good sessions, but he would just go, cut it short, come on, let's come across here, let's have a five-a-side, let's have some <laughs> games. But as I said, our five-a-sides, they were renowned because Kevin's obviously, he'd come from the Liverpool era where it was like the five-a-side um, games that you had, your touch and everything had to be spot on. So any new signings that we had, straight away we'd have a small side of game. And the players that had been there would be testing that player, testing them, whipping balls in, what your touch like, you know, what what's everything like. Some players could cope with it and some couldn't. Um, but that's basically what it was. And as I said, Kevin's team start would be pretty much the same. Look around the dressing room. Look left, look right, look around the dressing room, look at the players. Think of their team. They are not in any way, shape or form on the same level as us. Go out, entertain these people. They've paid a lot of money to come and see you. Entertain them. They deserve it. And then that's what we used to do. Let's go out. Let's do it. It's actually like quite... I'm just trying to think of the word. It's quite like... I'll come back to it. Go on. Go on. I'll come back to <laughs> it. I just remember when I spray you... Okay, and what were you playing like when he stuck the nut on somebody? And he did. Keith hand. Curl away at Man City. Keith Curl? How? Uh, no red card? No, it wasn't. You should see it. Blatant oh. butt. Yeah. Not I can remember. Um, no, it was a, Yeah. We hadn't signed Tino yet, and uh, we had a warm up game for England, and we played Columbia, and Tino was playing. And I remember Kevin come up to me and went, see, see what you think he's like. You know, let me know afterwards how, how how the game was, how difficult it was. He easy, you know, this kind of thing. I think we drew Columbia nil nil, and um, as a defender, that that I was one of these where I could kind of guess where the forward was going to go, where his touch was going to be, and then you could read it, nick it, or, or just anticipate. Uh, with Tino, I couldn't, and the main reason was he didn't know what he was going to do. <laughs> he was just. <laughs> You just didn't know, <laughs> you know, and you had to be so wary of that. You So you just thought, I'll back off a little bit because he would try something so outrageous, you'd think, what the bloody hell? How has he thought of that? So I can remember speaking to Kevin afterwards and he went, how did you... I said, I found him difficult because I didn't know what he was going to do, purely and simply because he doesn't know what he's going to do. Um, I mean, obviously we signed him and again, not only was a fabulous, fabulous player, great lad, Absolutely fantastic lad. Mad as a box of frogs, but great lad. Did you get to any of the, the, the house parties? Went of one or two. He used to love Disney. <laughs> well, I never. He used to love I Disney. Of course you were a Mickey Mouse fan. I kid you not. 
you know if you went in the Disney store, store and you could buy the Disney jamas and stuff, but the old school Disney jamas store, it would basically be like a dress thing that you'd put on and it would go all the way down. A bit like a onesie. <laughs> yeah, but it was like not a onesie that went, you'd put each leg in. It was just like a, a sheet. Like, like a nightie. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like a winking. nightie <laughs> with Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck on <laughs> and he'd have a, a goofy hat. But, <laughs> but he used to go to bed in that. But we used to go to his we used to go to his house because he lived up next to the airport. And there was there was all kinds, man. Honestly, there was like alpacas outside and everything. It was just trump, <laughs> like like a nobby like a nobby Slaughter. There was trumpets playing and these like uh, whistle things. Like you know, it was just mental. <laughs> so we had alpacas in the garden. Yeah, you just have them just strewn all over. Sometimes you'd open the door and there'd be one in the bloody house. <laughs> it was raged. Absolutely mental. Yeah, got this, Can you imagine getting uh, Joffrey Joff air on coming to America with, with giraffes and that walking down the street? Just oh, driving was... down his drive, there's alpacas and everything, and then he, he's misses his watery flowers in a negligent in high heels, <laughs> and then he comes out in, in goofy suit. And he used to have like, some, some family, and they'll all be sitting on a set, eh? and they'd all have this like kind of dress wear from Columbia, but every one of them would have an instrument. And they'll be like fluting and playing away and stuff like that, just in the background. But obviously, he'd have like the daft music that he'd get from Julie's, the nightclub, to blast in another room. <laughs> but you could go from one room where it was like bang, 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 and all the daft <clears throat> music, and you go in another one and you just get authentic Columbia. It was mental. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to go to one of his bars. Did, uh, did he embrace the, the the drinking culture and everything, the British lads? And... Oh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I'm not going to get too much information how much he embraced it, but he just he just loved it. As I said, he would. Um, we always used to go to the Quayside in Newcastle, and all the boys did, and we did it like uh, every Monday or Tuesday night. Um, we used to go for something to eat, and then go to like kind of Jimmy's and then Julie's, um, and he just loved it. I mean, it was just. I mean, back in the day, there was no like mobile phones. That certainly not mobile phones, and certainly not one with cameras, and we've got away with bloody murder. Absolutely murderous, just as well, because, you know, um, it would have been in the papers every every single day. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be flying as well, though, weren't you? So it must have been yeah. a class time to be a Newcastle player. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why Kevin had kind of was, was absolutely fine with it. In fact, he encouraged it, to be quite honest, like, go out, enjoy yourselves. And the camaraderie we had was second to none. I mean, you'd, you'd sort of seen about camaraderie. Every single one of them players, I've still got the mobile numbers, and we all still keep in touch. You know, that, that that's half up. the battle, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Who was it that still FaceTimes Aspria? Was it Clarky? Just randomly gets a FaceTime from Aspria. Yeah. Has a bit of do you know the, there's there's an advert right now? It used to come on about a year ago, and it was this big. It's like this inflatable kind of pterodactyl type thing, but it's actually on a horse. And the horse is running around this big yard, kicking this massive inflatable football. I think it's on a Vodafone advert. It's a, that's actually Tino Espria. <laughs> <laughs> His garden is that a fact? <laughs> it is. He's <laughs> fucking nuts. <laughs> He's nuts. <laughs> what was the crack with um, Beardsley and Pollock? Jamie Pollock. But this one with Jamie Pollock was um, we were in the we were in the tunnel, and Pollock was going, "I'm going to get you, Beardsley. I'm going to do you." And and Jamie was what Jamie was about. He was he could he was half decent. Probably not the most gifted player in the world without being too disrespectful. But Peter was the best player I've ever played with. He was by far by far the best ever player that I've played with. And I've played with some wonderful players. And Peter's just like nodding at him as though, like, yeah, whatever. And and basically Pollock was so, sort of threatening him, sort of saying he was going to kick him, he was going to do this. And very early doors, you could see Pollock was hunting him down, just wanting to kick him, just wanting to hurt him. Peter was too clever. He was just getting rid of the ball so quickly. And he couldn't get anywhere near him. This one time... Uh, Pedro got the ball. And do you know that trick that he does? Uh, and everybody knows it's coming, but you can do bugger all about it. Is that the one where he... Yeah, the, like the step. The step. Thing. Yeah. Um, he did that, and Pollock just went whoosh, went past him. Peter played the ball through, and we nearly scored. And um, the fans had, had started laughing, really, because Peter had made him look like a fool. This was at Ayrson Park. Anyway... Pollock wasn't very happy and he'd stood up and he'd get into Peter's face and Peter just stepped back and went, fuck me, you're ugly. Uh, <laughs> really? That's, that's, a bit, that's a bit rich, Pete. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So if Peter Beasley calls you fucking ugly, then you're fucking ugly. <laughs> I've asked a couple of people about the uh, the Dublin trip. I think Andy, uh, Andy Griffin wasn't there with Gillespie and Shearer. I'm hoping you were, though. 
Well, the the big thing about that was, um, I know Keith tells it and tells it in his book, but he he, he withholds information. <laughs> um, so I'm going to divulge it. <laughs> um, what had happened was uh, Kenny Kenny was away, but he was meeting us, Kenny Daglish. And so Terry Mack took the lads to, to Dublin. Kenny, Kenny was going in the next day. Terry Mack taking a group of lads on the drink, basically just carnage. You know for a fact carnage is just going to ensue. So we've cracked on, on, the, on in the airport. We're on the plane. We're getting to the hotel. Terry Mack's gone. Gaffer's going to get here. Uh, you know, at, at such and such a time, we'll have a meeting. So we've all gone out. And again, we, we don't go out in little groups. We all went out together. Now, we always used to play games. You know yourselves, you've been in like kind of groups where a few of the players have gone out. Sometimes you just stand next to the bar and have a couple of drinks. Sometimes you want to have a right good few drinks, but have a, have a laugh about them. So we used to play games, you know, and obviously the punishment was what was in the middle and it could have been any kind of concoction of drink. Uh, we used to play names of and buzz and all that kind of thing. You know them games, don't you? Mm. So Keith Gillespie, believe it or not, is actually very clever, very clever even though his nickname's Dizzy, but that's because of Dizzy Gillespie, trumpet player. <laughs> and um, we were playing this game, and, and this game, it's absolutely paramount that you switched on early doors, because if you l- lose a few in a row, you're knackered, and you're just drinking constantly, and then it's like, good night, you're gone. And uh, Keith had had a couple of drinks, and he was he was quite tipsy. Keith At that time, Keith couldn't drink. He was piss poor. And, and he was already chewing, in all fairness, because... I think early on in the night, early on the day, sorry, because it was still early afternoon. I think he'd he'd gone to loo and somebody hadn't held the door for him, and he and he was just he was just being awkward, and he was one of these where he was just wanting to fight somebody, and he'd kind of fight, he's soft as shite, to be quite honest. So we played these games, and uh, and he kept on getting it wrong, so it wasn't going around, so we couldn't really get started because it wasn't going around. And Al was hammering him, battering him, calling him worse than rotten, and uh, anyway. Keith, on, on one time when Al's hammered him because he's getting it wrong, he's gone, he stood up and he went, listen, I'm, I'm swearing a lot. I didn't, don't worry about it, it's fine. He went, listen, you fucking baldy bastard. He went, you call me one more time, me and you's going outside. And I was going, fucking sit down, you idiot, sit down. So we sat down, it must have gone round twice, and then it comes back to Keith, gets it wrong again. <laughs> For some reason, I've got a champagne cork top in my hand. And I've gone fucking hell dizzy and I've bounced it off the table and it could have gone anywhere, but it actually bounced and hit Keith right in the eye. <laughs> but quick as a flash, Shiro went, fucking hell, look at you. He says, you're the only Irishman that doesn't know where cork is. <laughs> <laughs> Just because it's a cork. Anyway, Keith's gone, that's it, fucking get up. Come on, outside now, outside. So I'm sitting with a lad called Des Hamilton. Remember Des Hamilton, the midfield player from uh, Bradford? And uh, we used to uh, we used to call Des Armadillo for some reason. But Des Hamill, have you ever watched the film Jumanji, the very first one? Do you know what all the animals when they run past and then you see the big fat rhino? Just, <laughs> <laughs> well, that was Des. <laughs> so Des says to me, "Went boy, what are you doing? Are you not going to go outside?" I went, I'm not, "No, I'm not." I says, "I'm at the embryo stage of a drinking session here." <laughs> I says, "I'm not going." I says, "That's Alan Shearer." I said, he's a world-renowned superstar. And I says, that's that stupid, bloody Irishman. I said, it's broad daylight. I said, they're not going to fight. They're not going to fight. I went, if you want to go, mate, crack on. I'm sitting here, I'm having my pint. Des goes, literally 30 seconds later, I hear the rhino. <laughs> he's hit him. He's hit him. <laughs> he's only fucking hit him. So I've, gone, oh. so I've ran up, and he's, I'll stand over Keith, and Keith is out, and there's claret all over the floor. And I've looked at Al, I've gone, what have you done? He went, I've hit him. I went, well, I can see that. <laughs> I said, what? Well, he says, well, he tried to hit us, so I've hit him. I went, look, you go, just go. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll look after Keith. I think Rob Lee's took Al away. <clears throat> I've looked after Keith. Now, just a little bit uh, after that, uh, away from the story, there was me, Warren Barton, Rob Lee, and John Beresford. We did this big do at the Lancastrian Suite. There's about 600 people there, and it was a Q&A. And the very first question, it was a Roman mic. Um, who's got any questions? Everybody's put their hand up. The mic's got on this blog. Uh, Warren, Warren Barton, what happened between Keith Gillespie and, and Rob Elliott? Bear in mind, we've been told, say, no, say nothing. And Warren Barton went, I wasn't there, but the boy was. So I thought, fuck it, right. Do you know what? I'll tell the story. <clears throat> so I told the story. 
So I told the story and I'm driving back. Shira comes up, my phone rings, Shira. And I know for a fact Rob Lee's been on the phone straight away. Alan, 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 Steve, I've been telling the story. <laughs> so I'm going, hello. He went, you macking bastard. I said, what's the matter? He went, you told the story, you told the story. I said, relax, man, relax. He said, what do you mean, relax? I said, I told the story. I said, Keith came for you. I said, you ducked, boom, hit him. Like Tyson, dropped him. I said, the full 600 people were going, she rose, she rose. <laughs> he went, what the? I went, I. He went, well, you keep on telling the fucking story. <laughs> <laughs> So I've told I've told that story. So anyway, when I get back to the hotel, I've just told the lads like, "Oh, listen, he's being hit by some drunk person coming past." Rob Lee tells a story. I've told uh, the guard the the, the guardian, um, he's being hit by a drunk driver. How on earth am I supposed to know he's being hit by a drunk driver? I don't know, but that's what they tell. But Keith Keith tells that story as well that he was hit by a drunk driver. And he, he says, "How thick Steve Howie, by the way." So I thought, "All right, well I'll fell you," because when I was in the ambulance with Keith Gillespie. Uh, uh, back to the hospital and he hasn't put this in his book and he doesn't see it when he does after dinners or anything like that he forgets to mention when he's in the ambulance even though he's knocked the f out and he's got blood all over, over him he's actually shit and pissed himself as well <laughs> and he forgets to mention that <laughs> so that's mentioned now how stupid how are you keith gillespie <laughs> I think that could have sold over 10,000 copies, that story. I got fucked up there, Keith. Was Al, uh, was Al Burr, uh, Philip Al Burr, the same, who's happy with the Cavalier uh, attitude of Keegan. He was he was happy to plunge forward. Phil was, what a, I mean, what a player. I, I didn't know a great deal about him, to be quite honest. Oh. I knew he was a good player. I'd watched him for Belgium in the World Cup. Um, but... You know, do you know when you you see somebody? Sometimes you'll just see a player on the TV and stuff. Do you think, oh, he's a good player? Uh, to to train with Philippe, day in day out was um, was amazing. I mean, he was he was. I mean, he was absolutely brilliant. He, he was basically though. Philippe was uh, basically Belgium's answer to Chubby Brown. He was the filthiest, dirtiest man. <laughs> and I'm not talking on the field. Oh my God, he, he was. He was just so rude. I'll give you a, I'll, I'll give you a, so an rude. example. Um, it was the, the first time he played at home. I mean, obviously, my, my mum and dad are big football fans, and um, we were in the players' lounge, and my, my dad had sort of... Uh, I was with my mum and dad, and, uh, and my dad's gone, Steve, do us a favour. Um, can you introduce me to Philippe Albert? And I was like, yeah, of course. So Phil was different to, to David um, because she had to call Dave Ginola David, where... Instead of Philippe, it's just Phil. Yeah, just, just liked it. You know what I mean? Um, so I've uh, I've gone uh, Phil. I kind of waved him over and I says, "Oh, Phil." I said, uh, "This is my mum Yvonne. Uh, this is my dad Norman." And uh, have you ever, ever watched a lower law? And the, the the big cop by that sort of uh, the way that he <laughs> speaks and stuff like that. It was just pissing. Yeah, uh, yeah, low. So <laughs> he goes. Uh, he, he basically blanks me, Dad, and he goes. Uh, Ah, Yvonne, I have heard a lot about you. <laughs> and my mum's like, what? <laughs> I have heard you've only had two lovers, the Army and the Navy. And I've basically, basically sort of saying, my mum's had two lovers, the Army and the Navy, so she's basically shagged all the Army and all the Navy. <laughs> and I've gone, Fleet, that's my mother. <laughs> and he went, she fucking loves it, Steve. <laughs> Yeah, oh, my mum's kill, killing herself laughing. I'm like, Phil, what are you doing? <laughs> but he, he just loved Chubby Brown. I mean, we used to, as I said, the entertainment manager was Watto. Watto brought on Sid the Sexist, and that was it. I mean, he would he would just see it. You know, we'd be in the tunnel, for instance, and um, you know, it'd be always on Sky, um, and there's thousands out there. There's millions watching at home, and normally in the tunnel, you're like, right, lads, come on. You know, do this. Are we ready? Come on, let's do this. So all the, all the lads would be shouting, we could be playing against Tottenham, Arsenal, Liverpool, whoever, anybody, Barnsley, could have been anybody. And uh, when we finished and just quiet, and he'd go, lads, lads, we'd turn around and he'd just go, titsuit. <laughs> so, so the sexist used to say titsuit all the time. <laughs> You could see the players that, I mean, we knew what he was talking about because that's the sexist, but you could see the opposition thinking, has he just said tits out? <laughs> <laughs> and he used to just stand there at the back because he used to always come out kind of one of the last ones and he was just a wronging, an absolute wronging. But 
I mean, such a wonderful player, but the filthiest, dirtiest man you could ever meet. <laughs> See, I've never had that from him either. No. No. <coughs> I wouldn't have had him down as that. Tattoo. Yeah. You know, he'd always got his cock out, hasn't he? If I had his tail, I would as well, because <laughs> it was a decent size. It was decent. Not Les. Not Les. You didn't want to get in the show with Les, because that, that, that thing used to look at you and you'd be like... <laughs> Kind of, that's going to attack me at any moment. That, that were a different entity. I mean, that had, I mean, that basically had its own shower. Les, Les would send him one bit of shower and his tail would stop in another bit and have its own shampoo and everything. It was bloody massive. <laughs> were there any lads who wouldn't have it? And just like, oh, no. like, I can't imagine David Ginola. No, it was funny. I mean, D Dave was absolutely quality. You know, we just had such a wonderful atmosphere that we just used to laugh because he was, he was funny. He was really, really funny, and it was just a great atmosphere to be around. You know, even sometimes lads used to sort of say, Phil, get your tail out. <laughs> and he would just used to get his... I mean, sometimes what he used to do, and I've heard it happens absolutely... It happens kind of... Uh, I used to speak to Richard Dunn. I played with Richard Dunn at Man City, and he used to tell me a couple of the Man City players used to do it. But he used to actually just unzip and get it out and just stand there, and it could be... It, could, it might be in a nightclub, it might be in a pub, but it could be just in a normal meeting of like general people and his tail used to be out <laughs> and he'd just be chatting away going, oh yes, 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 <laughs> yes, it was a very, it was a difficult game, but his cock would be out. <laughs> I like it. He him. just didn't, people just didn't realise. <laughs> You're going on the register for that now. You know, oh, he would oh. stand there for about 10 minutes with his tail out and just like <laughs> chat away and people would never, we'd be laughing because we'd know what he would do. One of the lads, Martin Woods, has got a belter as well and he used to go up to people and wrap it round his wrist and go, oh, can you tell us the time I've had... I've had too many drinks and just uh, people are looking at his cock round his wrist. <laughs> what, what a fuck. What time is it? What a talent. <laughs> well, I've heard some lads actually put the watch on, on that as well and just, like, have that... So the watch was actually on the tail. On the wood. And and basically sort of say, can you tell me... Is that, is that what, what... No, right. I mean... Th Team, I, I, no, you I, wouldn't. I, I just got to see a well fair play because I'm just not in that league. No, we're just bitter, aren't we? <laughs> bitter and twisted. It must have been a shock for the players. You've gone from our deal as, you know, seems to be quite rigid and whatever to Keegan. How was the how was the transformation from them though? Um, was he was he rigid and stuff, our deal as No, not really. I mean, he had a, a great bloke with him and Tony Galvin, you know, the lad that used to play for Tottenham. He used to fly down the wing and whip balls in with his left foot. Um, but no, not really. I mean, listen, the lads used to, like the, the Mark McGee's, uh, Mickey Quinn, um, Roy Aikens, all these, Kevin Scott, Bjorn Christensen, Tommy Wright, all these kind of people, you know, there were still lads that maybe had a night out and stuff like that, but I wasn't really part of it. I don't know what they got up to, to be quite honest. I imagine just had a few drinks and had a laugh and a, a giggle like players do. Let's be honest. Players, when we go out, we're like bloody bands, you know, we're, we're like kids, we just yeah. fanny on and, and piss about. Uh, but to, we went all of a sudden kind of more mainstream, more like more high profile than than what we were. And that's obviously not disrespectful to any of us because Mark McGee was Scottish international, Roy, Roy, uh, Roy Aiken played so many games for Scotland, Mickey Quinn was an unbelievable goal scorer, and all these other players. But all of a sudden, we had massive household names. And these massive household names, when you get to meet them, they're just like us. You know, they're just normal lads that's a little bit, mm. little bit weird, a little bit strange, a little bit just up for a laugh. Um, but we went from kind of, I mean, we were called the entertainers and, uh, under Kevin Keegan. But it was funny because I was talking to Lee Clark about it not so long ago. We had a training session under, under, uh, Oz, uh, under Aussie. And it was basically, it's called shadow play. You probably know what it is. It's, it's, it's basically, he picks his 11 that's going to start on the Saturday or, or through the week, um, which is which it was then pretty much your goalkeeper of 4-4 four, four and a 2. And you've got a full-size pitch, you're playing against nobody, and um, you take the kick off. And what the the emphasis of the of the session is, is basically just try and get, get some goals and then come back and start again. So the, the two centre forwards take the kick off, they pass it back to the midfield player, he's supposed to spread it left or right, the winger goes down the wing, the full back goes around him, overlaps, you play him in, he crosses it, two centre forwards are in there with a midfield player at the edge of the box, other winger comes in with the side. That's all you've got to do, put it in the empty net, walk back, go to the other side. So Aussie has set us up in exactly the same way, 
So there was me and um, there was a lad up front at that particular time. He's called Andy Hunt. We've took the kickoff, passed the back to Lee Clark. Lee Clark's passed it back to Kevin Scott. Again, we're playing backwards and we should be going forwards because we ain't playing anybody. <laughs> Kevin Scott gives it to Steve Watson, who's right back. And Steve Watson turns round and passes it back to Tommy Wright, who's in goal. Tommy Wright was putting his gloves on in the back of the net. The ball goes in the goal. <laughs> we're getting beat 1-0. <laughs> we ain't playing any fucker. <laughs> and we were going through a really bad time at the time, and you could just see Ozzy just rocking. <laughs> With his hand, he's in his hands and he's going, fucking hell, boys, we're shit, man. <laughs> we're getting beat 1 0 and we ain't playing anybody. That's how bad it was. So we went from that to where Kevin had got us. Uh, and it was just, you know, you, you just couldn't, you couldn't understand how. I mean, as a player, I was blessed. I was one of the lucky ones that seen it from how bad it was to where we got to. To how good it got to how amazing it was, just looking at the players and thinking. I mean, there was times I'd play in a game and I'd be standing next to Phil, if I was lucky, because he'd be off, or Peasy. And, I, and, and you'd be in St James's Park, and if, you, if you've been lucky enough to play at St James's Park and you look at the atmosphere that it is now as well, it is unbelievable. I mean, unbelievable place to play. So passionate, amazing fans. And I can remember standing there a good few times with Peasy and just sort of saying to Peasy, how lucky are we? Because you've got that atmosphere and I'm on the same pitch and people I can call my teammates, my friends, that are so blessed with their ability and I'm actually getting paid for it as well. I'm just thinking, oh my good God, Peter Beardsley, Andy Cole, Les Ferdinand, Alan Shearer, David Ginola, Speed, Lee, Gillespie, list goes on and on of just uh, Aspria, just amazing players and just thinking, how am I here? Mm. I was playing for a team that was so bad a few years ago and look where we are mm. now. And this is Champions League or, you know, top of the Premier League and stuff like that. It was just scary. Mad, isn't it? You know, you said earlier, Peter Beards is the best player you've ever played with. But it's better than Shearer. I think for the all-round game, Alan Shearer, you've got no understanding how good he was. It's, it, he was just ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Um, I mean, I played against Al a good few times. You'd feel as though um, you've got. You, for me, as a centre half, I'm thinking he ain't doing anything. I'm on easy street here. He's not causing me a problem, but he gets half that, like a half a sniff goal. Was he the best finisher I've ever played, like or played against, or been a, a teammate with? I would say no. I would say the best finisher for me was Robbie Fowler, but the pound for pound player. As a as a centre forward, it has to be Al, 100%. I mean, he goes in anybody's team. Um, he was just absolutely prolific. His nickname was Shock, Shocks, because it would be like, who scored? Shearer, Shock. <laughs> so that's what his nickname is. Do you know, did you ever play against him when he had his pace? Because I remember a lot of him at the end of his career after his injuries and stuff where he adapted his game. Imagine playing against him when he's fucking mm, rapid anyway, as well. Well, I played against him when he was in Blackburn. And um, I mean, obviously, there was likes of him, there was Newell, or there was Sutton. And they did like that ball, it would call it in the gully. I mean, I know this is called under the cosh, where not people actually know what under the cosh means. And not a lot of people know what the gully is, but it's the channel. Do you know that one between the centre half and the full back in the, down them channels? And he used to turn and run. Um, as I said, I was kind of lucky in a way where I, I read the game okay. So I would always get there. He wouldn't cause me a problem that way. But somebody like him, somebody like Fowler, you cannot give them that much room in the penalty area. You cannot, because they'd score. And ultimately, if you did, they, they did. What was mm. the crack with Keegan and Aspria with the Spanish? <sighs> oh, um, yeah, we'd, we'd signed Tino, and uh, we had a, we had, our dressing room was so close, we didn't like any um, people in there that shouldn't be in there. I mean, obviously, you know, yourselves, you have dressing rooms before the game, you get people coming in with the kids and stuff and you maybe just get a few photographs and all that. But after a certain amount of time, bang, they're gone. Um, and when we signed Tino, there was this bloke in and um, he actually turned out to be a really lovely fellow. He was called Jimmy Wallace and he was an interpreter. Um, but we couldn't understand why we had an interpreter because although Tino's from Colombia, um, they speak Spanish. And Kevin, before he, he came as manager of Newcastle, he, he lived in Spain. He lived in Marbella for like five, six years. So you'd have thought he'd pick up 
A bit of Spanish. Yeah, a bit of Spanish. <laughs> so we're having a pop at the gaffer, just sort of saying, hold on a second, why is he in the dressing room? Nothing against them, but it's the lads. This is the lads or the staff that's only allowed in here. And he's gone, uh, no, he's just there for a little period of time. He says, you know, I'll get rid of him. Um, I'm taking lessons, you know, I won't be long and stuff like that. Anyway, weeks and weeks had gone by and Jimmy's still there, still there, still there. And there was this one game we played away to Aston Villa and uh, Jimmy wasn't there. So we were like, oh, bloody hell. And again, Kevin would do his normal team talk, like I'd mentioned earlier. Um, but we were, in, we were in the tunnel. And I think Bob, uh, Rob Lee had sort of said, uh, has anybody seen the gaffer speak to Tino? And I think another one of the lads has gone. He must have just grabbed a hold of him in the hotel and just sort of like rang his room up. Tino, come, come to the room and I'll, I'll do a little of tactics and stuff like that. Um, well, thought nothing of it. We've got a game to concentrate on. Let's just crack on. Now, we're speaking about Alan Shearer before. And um, when you're under the cosh and you play the ball up to your centre forward, what you want them to do is get a hold of it, get a free kick, just get, get a throw in, get something. You know, give us a breather, give us a little bit so we can push up or get five yards up the pitch because we're just getting, we're dropping deeper and deeper and deeper. The ball goes up to Tino, he'd do something wonderful, absolutely brilliant, but other times he would do something and you'd be thinking, he's got, you know, he's got Adidas trampolines on, and bounce off him. And uh, we were 1-0 up and we were coming to the, like, the latter stages of the game, you're talking like 85th minute onwards. Uh, a couple of balls has gone up to Tino and he, he miscontrols them, or he doesn't get a hold of it and stuff like that. But now we're like 89th minute and Bez just bends the ball up down the line. Tano tries a trick, doesn't come off. They have a bit of um, kind of forceful attack and, uh, attack and play. It doesn't come to anything, but it puts us under pressure. Now we're in the 92nd, 93rd minute. We're still 1-0 up. And the ball goes up to Tano and it just bounces off them. They go down and they hit the crossbar. Well, of course, Kevin on the bench is absolutely chewing. So he stood up and he's shouting in the top of his voice, Tino, Tino, when the fucking ball yo comes up yo, no more fucking flicking yo. Get a fucking hold yo. And Keith Gillespie had been dropped. Then forward and went, Gaffer, see them lessons are coming on a fucking tree. Well, Keith was out of the game for another 10 weeks, didn't he? That's brilliant, man. Do you remember how you felt when Dalgleish came in? Do you think if he got kind of went in between the Keegan, Keegan's up there in terms of out expressing yourself and what? Do you just think if he came in and organised you with the same lads and brought a couple of more faces in, it would have would have worked? Well, you know yourself. You both know yourself. When a new manager comes in, it's a different ball game altogether. Because whilst the manager that's just gone fancied you, or the manager that's just gone didn't fancy you, the new manager that comes in now doesn't like you and likes you. Mm. So our, everybody starts again, kind of from scratch. Well, the vast majority of players. Um, so we had Les. Les left. He went to Tottenham. Um, we had David who left because Dav, Dav was really David was really annoyed because Kevin had promised him because Barcelona had come in for David, and Kevin had basically convinced him to stay, and then Kevin left. So Dave was like pissed. In all fairness. Um, but Kenny came in and had his own ideas, you know, he had his own players that he wanted to bring in. And the dynamics just changed. Obviously, Kenny brought in, um, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I really like Kenny. I think he was a great, I, 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 he was so much for the players, it was frightening. Um, I still see him now, I think he's a f fantastic man. Um, but he brought in uh, John Barnes, he brought in uh, Rushy and, and, and people like that, and great lads again. But... Basically, the whole squad got completely changed. You know, when you look at what mm. the squad was, and that's why the lads were annoyed because if, Kev, if Kevin had stopped for another season, we could have ironed out little different things, maybe got one or two different players in, whether it was in my position or not, fine. But we would have, <clears throat> we would have won the league, absolutely. But that didn't happen. So, you know, the rest is history, really. I think he's there under Dalglish and Hullett's come in and <laughs> again. He took, he took you down took again. Further, yeah, I mean, I was pleased with Root, uh, to be quite honest. Um, I was sorry to see Kenny go. I, I, I love Kenny. But Root was, Root was one of these where it was a bit like Glenn Hoddle, where he'd go, listen, all I want you to do is throw me the ball. So he'd throw the ball, he'd chest it, and he'd volley it, and it would go <laughs> 60, 70 yards away to somebody 
right there, right at the feet or right at the chest. That's all I want you to do. <laughs> and Rue would do that, but he would be asking all the players to do it. And somebody like Nikos Dabitas, and Nikos Dabitas, bless him, I love Nikos, great in the air, fucking awful on the floor. <laughs> awful. <laughs> and he's asking Nikos to chest it and volley it, head height, <clears throat> 70 yards into somebody's chest. It ain't going to happen. So, of course, he's getting, Rude's getting frustrated. Why? I, th th this is so easy. This is so easy. It's not rude. You're not rude, Ullet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're asking us to do that. We can't do it. No rude, Ullet. <laughs> you know, you've played with Van Basten and all these kind of players. You know, world superstar. You're not going to get the same out of a few, a, a few of us, to be fair. And I'll clue myself in that. I'm thinking, I can hit a ball, but at the same time, well, you know, I'm not rude, Ullet. Yeah. And he would just get a little bit pissed off with the players. Uh, but there was a big thing as well with Alan Shearer, you know, the egos and stuff like that. And it was weird at the time because at that particular time, Al was going through a bit of a dodgy spell with the goals and stuff like that. And believe it or not, and the Newcastle fans might not like this, but they weren't exactly brilliant with Alan. They were, they were giving him a bit of stick. And um, there, was, there was obviously that little bit about them. Uh, I'd had enough. I, under Kenny, I'd asked to leave because I just sort of said, I've had enough, I'm sick of this. It's just, you know, it's, I, I feel as though I need to move on. I need to have something different. I'd been there about 12 years uh, in the first team and I just felt as though it was the right time to move. Uh, the club had annoyed me because I'd, I'd asked for a testimonial, which they didn't give me. So I just thought, listen, F this, I'm, I'm off. Why, would, why did they refuse to give you that? I don't know. They just didn't want to. And I just was annoyed. So I just thought, well, fine, not a problem. I don't owe you anything. I've played when I never should have played. I've had three of the worst injuries of my career. Um, and I've come back. I've put myself through hell. And I've come back. I've had enough. So I told Kenny this. And anyway, Kenny got sacked. Um, so I'm, I'm with Rude. Um, and... Anyway, I get a phone call and Ger it was Gerard Houllier. And he was basically sort of saying, you don't want to sign for Liverpool. And I was like, yeah, okay then. So I met Gerard Houllier, agreed absolutely everything. Was driving home and um, I never had an agent, never bothered with an agent. But at that particular time, when I, I just I just got one. Anyway, my agent was Ruth Hull's agent. So I'm driving home and I get a phone call off the manager, Ruth, and he went, uh, what's, what's going on? And I've said, I'm signing for Liverpool. He went, please, please don't sign until you come and see me tomorrow morning. So he said, come and see me at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. I went, all right. So I, I met him and he went, uh, why are you leaving? I said, I've had enough, to be quite honest. I said, I don't like the situation with Alan. And I just sort of said, it's crap. I don't, I don't, it's, not, it's not for me, you know. There's just too much politics. I want to play football. I want us to get where we were. I want to enjoy my football. And I've got none of them. We said all that. And he went, I promise to do this, I promise to do that, I promise to do the one, just promise to sign the contract. So he said, there's a four-year contract there for you. You know, and it was it was ridiculous money. And I went, all right, it wasn't about the money. I, I couldn't, honestly, I, I wasn't bothered about the money. I just wanted to enjoy football again. I wasn't. So I went, okay, then. So I got <clears throat> my agent to ring Jarrah Hooley up and sort of say, no, no, no deal. Sign a four-year contract. About five weeks later, he dropped out uh, against Sunderland. And... Um, Obviously, there was, there was all that that kicked off. Um, and I was like, I've got four years. I've got four years of just absolute turmoil, but Rude got sacked. But then I was like, oh, I was delighted because Savobi came in. Mm. So, um, you know, that was one of the, the big big things for me. I thought, brilliant, Savobi, it's, it's, it's going to be absolutely brilliant. And then I didn't have that long under Savobi, and he pulled me and went, the club need to sell players. We had, there's myself... There was a lad called Alan Goma, Lauren Xavier, um, Marcelino, and Nikos, uh, and a, another couple of defenders that could play. And he went, listen, we've basically sort of said to the clubs, unbeknown to you, everybody's kind of for sale. And he says, nobody's coming for any defender apart from you, and it's Man City, what do you want to do? And I went, I can't say anything. So um, even though I knew, I think it could have been a decent thing for... Um, for Newcastle under Sir Bobby, for Sir Bobby to come to me, I just thought, well, if you didn't want me to go, you wouldn't have mentioned it. Yeah, you wouldn't have even said anything <coughs> about it at all. So I went, right, fine, I'll go. If we go back to the uh, Keegan, sorry, the Shearer, Hullet, was that something from the off? Did you notice straight away that he was just being 
a bit no, off with him. And... Do you know what? I don't know what it was. I don't know whether it was Rude felt as though his nose was put out because, let's be honest, it's Rude Hullet. And, and obviously, Al, Al was it's Alan Shearer. You know, an absolute legend, an icon. And if I, your manager gets a job, you'd think he'd want to keep the best player on, 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 on board straight away. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the thing is, you know, we played that game against Sunderland um, and in the pouring rain, and he played uh, Paul Robinson up front. I think he might play with him. Um, I can't remember who he played up front with. But obviously, we had, we had Al on the bench and Big Dunk on the bench. And um, you guys were winning 1 0. Sullen scored two late goals. My feeling is, and it's just my feeling, but I think it's the general consensus of the boys. If Sullen, if Newcastle had won, Al would have left, and Rude would have been, you know, kind of wow, what an yeah. inspirational. He was yeah. right to drop yeah. Al, but yeah. Kevin Phillips scored a ridiculously late goal when he chipped it and bent it in. Um, and of course, the very next day, I think there was another other stuff that had came out about, shall we say, a different curricular activity that that had gone on with with Rude outside the club. Uh, that is hit Different the curricular activity. That's, a, that's, a fucking, that's an incredible way of putting it. I thought so. Um, <laughs> and of course, that hit the papers and gone. And then obviously, so what we came in, I think we played Chef Wade first game and I think Al scored six. What? I think we beat yeah. them eight and Al scored six or five. We beat them eight nil or <laughs> seven nil or something. It was a ridiculous score. And, um, and that was it, off and run. Was it, did he have issues with other players? Was it was it was uh, Rudolf there when when Ket Spire went absolutely mental and started kicking the the ball? No, the I think I might have. I, I don't know. I'm not sure if it was Kenny, right? But I mean, Tam was a. Uh, I mean, he's Georgian and the, the hot headed, the very passionate, um, great lad. Um, as I said, I think he came the same time as uh, John Dahl Thomason. Great lad, but. Just he was he took it so personally that he wasn't playing, and obviously we all know that one that when he scored and he was trying to boot the the hordens <laughs> and take his boots off, <laughs> boots off and everything, for losing yeah. the plot. That's but some I, that's some protest. Yeah. That, oh, he was right. Fuck it off. Fuck <laughs> it all. Fuck you. He must have been there. I mean, I must have, he must have been there with Rude, and Rude had took us paintballing, and um, Tamuri and a few of the other lads they'd done like kind of. Um, Army service for their country. Do you know when you've got to you've got to go into the yeah. and um, obviously we've got two teams. Everybody wanted to, everybody wanted to shoot rude. <laughs> <laughs> and did it when his when his hair coming out and his goggles just listening and, uh, We we split up in two teams and the lads is hide and stuff like that. Anyway, my team was against um, against Tamuri's, and we couldn't. The game was over. We couldn't find him. But he, he, he'd, he'd been an expert in camouflage, <laughs> right? And he was in the yeah. fucking trees. <laughs> He's in the trees. He was in the trees. <laughs> right, so we're just walking, walking back. The game's over. And he's come diving out like bloody Jean-Claude Van Damme with the flips and stuff like that. And he's gone, pow, 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 pow. And he's gone, die, you English pigs. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's gone, tell me to always go, no, fun. it's never fucking over. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's gone, <laughs> He was going, where's Hullet? Where's Hullet? <laughs> it's over, Tam. It's over, mate. Lost the plot. <laughs> oh, you weren't expecting that, Rude. <laughs> he went, I've got a current England international wearing a fucking emu costume, <laughs> and I've got one of the best videos in the country wearing a fucking tutu. <laughs> I went, I'm not going to bench. He went, I think you are, like. And I went, I'm fucking not. And he went, it's Terry. And I went, Terry you. And he went, Terry Venables. And I went, fuck off. And I put, and I put the phone down. I weed in it. And Stoney shit in it. But Eileen Drury basically picked the squad. <laughs> you could see a car pulled into the nearby with some blue lights flashing with a police car behind. And it would be the physio being pulled out of the car with his hands on the bonnet. I had three years left in my contract, which was worth a good couple of million. And I just went, you know what, stick your money up your ass. I walked out the door and I didn't really play again after that, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs>